The information in this podcast is current on the day of recording. It is general advice only and does not take your personal situation into account. It may not be suitable for you. Welcome to Stock Tech. My name is Gaurav Sodi. Joining me for today's episode is founder, editor, John Addis. Hey, John, you there? Yes, I am. Good morning, Gaurav. How are you doing? Welcome. Now, the audience can't see now, but the remnants of your part-time gigolo job were right <laughs> behind you. There was, uh, you, you missed out, <laughs> but there was, there was a whole stack of undies right, right there for, yeah. for all of us to see, uh, and it was not yeah. a pretty sight. Yeah, that, I just want to make it clear that if anybody did see them, they are not my undies. They're, they're my sons, and I wish they were somewhere else. I could bring them into view if you want. I, we don't really need to do that. <laughs> here they are. Oh, there they are. <laughs> all right. All right. Well, <laughs> you thought you, you you came you came for the investing insights. You stayed and for the stayed underwear. Stayed for the underwear. <laughs> that's right. At least he washes them. Yeah, at least. Well, that's that's good signs there. Um, Nick, you must be just overjoyed that the focus on your filing cabinet is now gone. <laughs> I am. That's the first thing that's sprung to mind. <laughs> Welcome. No, thanks for joining us today, Nick. Yeah, no, good to be here. Thanks, guys. Now, John, you've been down to a microcap conference, I think. This is one I saw pop up. A um, couple of interesting companies I wanted to hear from, but since you and Nath were going, I thought I'd just leave for <laughs> you guys to go and I could um, just uh, just hear how it went yeah. from you. So this is a great opportunity. So tell us about this um, this conference. First of all, um, I keep hearing from everyone that microcaps are historically cheap, that it's a malign part of the market. Um, I think if everyone is saying the same thing, it's less likely to be true. So I'm not quite sure about that. But um, I know there were some interesting stocks um, presented. So uh, why did you go? What did you see? Uh, I went last year. I found it quite interesting, if only to sort of reflect on the absolutely atrocious quality of many of the companies that were featured i went there yep. yesterday and the, the quality seemed to have improved um okay. so i think that was a good thing there were more people there and i think because the market has been so hit uh there are stocks there like money me where the share price is down what 95 percent and mm. the ceos are out there trying to market what they're doing in a way that they weren't 12 months ago so there's a definite change in sentiment amongst the CEOs and the small cats themselves. Where there's a change in investment sentiment, I really don't know. Uh, I'd say that's less likely. What, what were the stocks that you were interested in in particular, Gora? Camplify was the top of my list. This is a, a stock I've owned in the past. It was a bit of a bombed out IPO. I, I picked it up after the IPO bombed and made some good money on it. But um, I, I think what really attracts me is that um, we know that network businesses, these um, classified style businesses, you know, these, these um, uh, two-sided network effect businesses, <laughs> I can think of a bit more names for them if I can. Um, they, these are among the highest quality stocks anywhere in the world. We have wonderful examples of, of how they grow and how dominant they can be. And, um, and here's one in its infancy with a great idea um, with incentivized management that seems to be gaining traction and I'm quite interested in its progress. So yeah, I, I did want to hear your thoughts on it and, well, um, I, and what I, the CEO had to say. I, I saw three presentations yesterday. Nick might be able to add to this, but Camplify was by far and away the best one. Uh, yep. Nate's there today. I think the quality of the company is on day one. It was better than day two, but Nate That's will let us know case. that. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so I saw Camplify, Money Me, and EM Vision, which is a medical devices company that kind of does mobile oh, yeah. MRIs. Also looks mm -hmm. interesting. Camplify was by far and away the most, I think, the most interesting company from an investment perspective. I think it seems to have got a lot better from a year or two ago when we did have a look at it and we were talking about it and I think you actually invested in it. Uh, uh, slowly being established. They were in Australia, Spain, the UK, Netherlands and Germany. Uh, all those markets are growing very, very quickly and they seem to have an advantage in that their overall product offer to both people who own camper vans and RVs that are listed on the space is really attractive. 
So they cover off all the insurance and liability aspects in the mm. um, in the business. And they're getting lots of traffic. So the, the people who own camper vans and RVs are encouraged onto the platform. And the people who are traveling are increasingly considering this platform rather than the conventional way of doing it, which is the big rental van fleet-based companies uh, like Brits, uh, who mm. are probably their competition, although one of them owns about 30% of the Camplify stock, I think, as, a, as an insurance policy. I think it's really interesting. We're going to write it up, or I'm going to write it up on Friday. Uh, everything seems to be going very well. I think the big risk in this is that, you know, there could be another COVID, I suppose, would be uh, an outside risk that shuts down international travel. Uh, there is still competition in this space. They might get bought out too early, I suppose. I would have thought Airbnb this will be a natural acquisition for them down the track. It's probably not big enough yet, but if it does establish some kind of global global supremacy, then I think Airbnb might be interested in it. But they seem to be building a very good, very well thought through opportunity in lots of different markets, and this could be an it's it could be a, a business that does have global reach and network effects, and they're pretty rare. So I think it's worth us doing some work on it. Um, I don't think we'd issue a formal recommendation on it. It's just too small. But for members who want to do their own research, the story we publish on Friday will probably get them started. Yeah. Nick, is this one you've come across in your former life in small caps? <laughs> yeah, no, it is. And I, I agree with the sentiment. It's um, it's certainly one of the better small caps um, out there. And it does look like an acquisition target. I mean, for a company like Airbnb or Booking.com, it's only 130 million market cap, so it's a that's a drop in the bucket for those um, uh, for those companies. I think I think the strategy. Um, I was a bit skeptical at first when they started to expand overseas, but I mm -hmm. come around to thinking that that was absolutely the right move. Um, it's better to entrench yourself globally than just domestically. I think we saw that with uh, Airbnb, who sort of took over the global market share and focused on the globe rather than one specific um, country, unlike I think it was stays in Australia um, mm. that uh, the stayed domestically. So came off mainly expanding throughout Europe at the moment. And the progress has been um, has been pretty good. So yeah, no, it's one definitely um, definitely on my radar. One of the things I like about Camplify is that they're a shot at um, at growing the entire market, not simply of, of grabbing market share from other players. I think this was the secret to Airbnb's early su success, yes. and why it was yeah. hidden for so long is because it, the idea just looked ridiculous. No one thought that people would lease out a couch or a, a room in their house to a stranger. It just seemed like a preposterous idea. And and similarly, leasing out your caravan, and people who own caravans are generally um, very proud of that particular asset. It's an important part of their lifestyles. Um, they've saved a lot of money for it. They maintain it fastidiously. And to have a stranger kind of stay in your caravan seems like an odd proposition. Um, but um, when you create the right um, ecosystem to connect in uh, that, that can sort of link um, two parties together and then you provide insurance on top of that which would be impossible for an individual lisa um, to acquire uh, i think that creates uh, the perfect conditions to grow this market and that actually get um, to bigger bigger players interested so yeah um, yeah i i, I am it's, it's a stock that's been on my watch list for a long time since i sold it um it's come down a long way and these are the kind of conditions where not many people are looking at these smaller tech platforms at the moment um they're either obsessed with with uh, sort of uh, prometicus and and wise tech um and altium or they're um or they're not looking at tech stocks at all so these are the kind of conditions um that we want to be looking at a business like this i think just a couple of numbers from the presentation i think yep. if you go and look at their last investor presentation they cover some of this but they take, uh, so from the overall transaction, uh, when somebody rents a camper van for three weeks or something, they take 38% of the revenue. That comes out at $437 per transaction. A larger mm. part of that is insurance. It's a fair amount of money. There's a lot of mm. repeat business in it, uh, and it's growing very quickly. And 
as with Airbnb, about 30% of the listings now are small businesses that have small fleets of RVs. So there are people who are buying RVs simply and, and caravans and yep. stuff simply yep. to put them on Camplify and that becomes their business. And mm. they're making about 15K per year from, from uh, renting mm. these on Camplify. And they actually have good resale value afterwards. So they That's buy right. these fleets, uh, lease them, um, earn a rate of return, and then sell the asset. Sell the vehicle. To, to yeah. reinvest into a new new asset. So it's, it makes a lot of sense for the supplier. And this is the challenge a business like Camplify has. Not only does it have to attract uh, renters, uh, it also has to attract assets. And it has to do that simultaneously. So he said enough... that, that's a constraint. Yeah. He said that's a constraint. Supply yeah. is the restraint. So it's all about showing hirers. Yep. It's a safe and secure experience for their vehicle. That's right. Very interesting company. So that'll be up on Friday. Yep. No, I like that. Um, that take rate, though. That I mean, Nick, um, we've spoken about it internally. Just give us. A I knew, I knew this would become a podcast on Camplify. <laughs> Sorry, I didn't mean it. <laughs> but it's just so interesting. Nick, give us a, a, a broader um, a look at what how that take rate fits internationally because that's that's high you said more than 30 percent on is yeah. high yeah it, it is high and i yeah it, so airbnb and booking take about 13 percent um, oh wow so yep. yeah so it's about double that um yeah no it, it's it's incredibly high and i guess that may be a risk but there it is a niche market yeah um yep. you know like you talking about a two trillion dollar accommodation market so there's so lots of competitors there Whereas this is, I don't even know the total addressable market, but it's a lot smaller. Mm. Um, and there just isn't the competition that um, mm. even the Airbnb or Booking or Expedia have um, in those markets. So for now, they're getting away with charging those take rates. Uh, mm. But yeah, if they come under pressure, um, you probably, sorry, if they, if they were to come under pressure, it would be probably due to competition that isn't there at the moment. Yeah. I yeah. think those take rates also include um, a insurance margin as well. So they don't underwrite their insurance policies. They have an agreement with Allianz and Allianz takes care of all their insurance, but they do broker their own insurance. So they do take a, I think it's like a 30% margin on the insurance, which I think that gets captured into the take rate. I'm not sure how they account for that, but that'll be um, something that might might explain why the number is is higher than we would expect because that does sound very high. But the, they, they are creating their own market. So you're right, Nick, at the moment, not much competition for them. Um, to hear them say it, they don't think there's anyone of their scale globally. So they are the market leader already. And that's really important in this kind of industry where the profits tend to go towards the top one or two um, providers in the entire industry. So you really need to establish dominance if you're going to be profitable. A couple of other stats, SaaS-based metrics, uh, customer acquisition cost, very important metric for this business, I'd imagine. This is the cost of getting a hirer. So once yeah. you get a hirer, you can expect to make $437 per transaction. Yeah. They are spending $11.68 to acquire oh, wow. Oh, wow. a hirer. <laughs> it will generate $437 per <laughs> transaction. That's very good. That's that's among the highest I've I've heard. Uh, that's that, astonishingly that low. Cap, that's, it's very that's good. Astonishingly yeah. low. Um, the it's almost Tesla like. You know, yeah. like they don't do a lot of advertising. People are just finding them, coming to them. Yeah. Uh, very different from Air Tasco, which was another presentation that was done. Like the CEO was excellent, but he's just. I think he's just in a way worse business and Camplify. <laughs> oh, no doubt. Air Tasco no um, is a introduction service um, yeah. where they link um, the two parties once. And then after that, they're basically not involved in any yeah. future transactions. Whereas this, because of the insurance aspect of it, um, it once you link parties together, you're always forced to really use mm. the um, the platform all the time. I'd be surprised if they weren't thinking about insurance for those little jobs. It might only be two or three dollars, but that might be some kind of lock in they could try and get. But it does get yeah. yeah, but it's going to be nothing like Camplifiers. Um, right. The owner's CAC, so if you are if you have a camper van mm. and you decide to, to rent it out on Camplify, it costs Camplify $135 to acquire a new owner. So if you look at the overall CAC, so you need the owner and the hirer, once you've got the owner, like that's for multiple hires. So mm. you, there's a much longer lifetime value on that. 
and then you've got the CAC on the hire themselves, and that's only eleven dollars sixty-eight. It's those metrics are phenomenal. You know, I know SaaS businesses. I've worked in them, consulted to them, sat on the boards of SaaS businesses, and it's they're kind of astonishing figures. Yeah, right. absolutely. I like it. I think that I think the other thing just to um, point out quickly. Um, yep. Not only the insurance side, which reduces friction, but uh, I think in Australia they have uh, roadside assist is covered. And I know oh. if I'm a renter yep. and taking away someone's asset, I'd be really worried if I break down or if, if something goes wrong. So they've, they've done really well there. I think they've got a partnership with um, an RMA to provide that. Yeah, That's a good good point, Nick, because these things venture yeah. almost by definition into really um, unusual territories. So I think it's an important part of the service, yeah. Yeah, well, I mean, we, we're getting into way too much detail here, but it is it is fascinating. They're expanding across Europe. They've got uh, a deal where they can sell sell insurance across Europe, and mm. they take a 30% commission on that. They've heard that Italy, everybody talks about Italy, saying being a terrible place to, to rent camper vans, uh, for what reasons I don't understand, but they've got an across Europe approach now, so they can enter those kind of markets and do it in a way that they've been doing it in Australia and New Zealand. Mm. They've also got a temporary accommodation program. So um, when I was living on the north coast of New South Wales and there were floods there probably about almost two years ago now, I think that the the rescue village for people who've been made homeless was completed probably six months ago. So it took me well over a year to make this village that pe- to house people. Um, Camplify have this temporary accommodation program where the government hires camper vans and caravans en masse to move into an area that's been affected by a government disaster and the government pays the cost uh, and Camplify sort of batch it all up and do the insurance and take a cut. So th- there's lots of interesting little things happening in this business, but in terms of the big metrics and the important metrics, uh, it's it's very interesting. What but there are going to be more acquisitions, I'd imagine. Lots oh, yeah. more acquisitions. You know, just on that last point there, John, um, John's Ling Group has, um, which is a kind of a, it, it's actually a, a, a builder constructor to the insurance um, industry. They've managed to weave this narrative that they're uh, exposed to climate change. And so they get these multiples that just really difficult to justify. And I wonder mm. if Camplify might eventually weave that same narrative, attract those same multiples. Um, <laughs> yeah. This is not something we would advocate, but um, but looking for those stories that can turn into meme stocks, not it's not an unprofitable venture. Meme stocks. I just say. <laughs> yeah, well, we, John, we don't John, Ling, John Ling is yeah. not far away from being a meme stock. I, I do not understand the multiple in that business. To me, that's a low margin uh, kind of inch, um construction business and um it's it's a wonderfully run business i think it's a high quality business but the multiple that attracts uh, i think is is completely um detached from reality mm. and that, that that's thanks to the business story that, that every value investor in australia used to own yes. john's ling and now it seems as though every investor in australia owns john's ling. <laughs> yes that's right <laughs> <laughs> yeah 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 well, once the share price starts rising a lot, that's amazing. That's amazing how a rising share price can create its own narrative and a falling share price creates its own narrative. But most people who analyze stocks and, um, you know, I hate that. at the risk of sounding uh, down on my fellow investors, most people analyze stocks, especially those who do it for a living. All they do is follow the share price and come up with reasons to tell you why a share price has done what it has done. And it's just very little. Laura, you're so around. you're so cynical. <laughs> <laughs> More yeah. than usual today. <laughs> More than usual. Yeah, you're probably right. Probably right. Nick, in, on the international side, one of the stocks I have been most curious about is Rightmove because um, this is essentially the REA of the UK at half the multiple. But we got some bad news the other day. Um, I want to get your take on it. Um, what does that mean for the Rightmove itself? But more interestingly, does can you tease out any implications for REA? REA is probably at the top of my list in terms of businesses I want to own, and I've never owned it, and it frustrates me no end. Are, are, is there going to be a shot at buying REA at some point? <laughs> um, well, I'll, I'll tackle what's happened at right now first. The, yep. the third competitor over there on the market, which has about 7%, market share compared to right move that has 85% market share yeah. uh, has been acquired by CoStar. 
And CoStar is a $30 billion US company that has a history of turning around underperforming property portals. So in 2014, they bought apartments.com, which was the sixth largest rental um, uh, portal in the United States. And that's now the number one uh, portal. They've done the, they're doing this, sorry, in residential as well to take on Zillow. They bought homes.com two years ago, and it only had I think, traffic of around 7 million people per month. And now that's up over 100 million uh, within just two years. And then they've gone from the sixth biggest player there to the second um, in terms of traffic. And they're looking to monetize that, uh, that, those eyeballs uh, next year. So I think that's why, so the right move share price has fallen 15% as CoStar has acquired on the market because the market's worried that they'll come and try and do the same thing to right move. Uh, so they've announced a hundred or over a hundred uh, million pound investment into sales and marketing. Uh, in the first year, that's going to be 46 million pound, which is three times the annual budget of right move. Mm. So even if, even if, Right move can defend uh, their position. It might actually mean that margins come down as they have to spend more. Um, in terms of implications for right, uh, for, sorry for REA, uh, CoStar have uh, announced that they're moving more into Europe. So the German property portal um, or the REA of Germany Scout Twenty Four has uh, the share price has also fallen. Uh, they haven't announced any plans for Asia Pacific, I don't think yet, and we don't have any tiny, tiny competitors. We just have the two, really. It's the duopoly between Domain and REA, Brilliant. and and Domain would take a, a far more substantial investment, I think, to um, uh, to take on REA than what they're uh, planning to do in Europe. So. For the moment, I don't think there's a risk um, to REA, but it is interesting that. What I would have said only a week and a half ago is a completely entrenched position that a, another company in the US with form in doing it has seen that as um, a real opportunity and a, a target. I'm amazed by that as well. Uh, I would not have guessed that that would have been possible. It's interesting to look at the market structure here in Australia with REA and Domain. REA would have to be just one of the most dominant businesses on the ASX and Domain has never really caught up there should be room i would have thought for for two profitable um high returning businesses in this segment such a big market but domain has never really posed a threat to rea um maybe in sydney i don't know the market shares that well nick but maybe in sydney but certainly globally rea uh, sorry certainly nationally rea trounces the competition mm -hmm. is that if if things change in the uk I mean, is is that indicative of what could one day happen here, or is it different in Australia? Um, I mean, it, it's hard to say. So to start with the UK, I actually think there's a um, well, we've still got a buy recommendation on uh, right move. I, I think CoStar will ultimately fail in this endeavour. Um, Why do you think? Number, um, yeah, the, there's a few reasons. Right move have. To, uh, so Google's taken on Rightmove, uh, Zoopla on the market itself, uh, Purple Bricks, and, uh, and they've thrown advertising dollars behind it. Maybe not the same investment as CoStar, but it's yeah. always failed. CoStar, is, this is CoStar's first um, foray overseas as well. The UK market is very different than the US market. Um, the US market uh, is still very was still very fragmented, where there was like eight or nine competitors in the UK, it's really just right move. Right move and Zoopla have ninety five or about sorry about ninety three percent, and on the market have the rest. There's hardly any competition. It's not the same market uh, yeah. dynamic. The other thing is they're just trying to target. They've already got this. so on the market. We'll bring the sellers, the agents um, on board. So that's why they're um, that's why they're making this acquisition rather than doing um, yeah bootstrapping from the ground up. Uh, but the other side, uh, the buyers, they're, they're very entrenched. So why would I, if I see a few more ads, am I really going to rush over uh, to On The Market or their new version of homes.com uh, if I've been using Rightmove and happy with Rightmove for the last 20 years? I think mm. there's just, there's it's sort of like um, Google search and 
uh, you know, in trying to take on Google search. I think there's just people underestimate how ingrained that thought process that you just go there, you know, without any thinking is. Mm. Uh, so I think it will be actually pretty hard for them to take uh, them on. And also, uh, right moves in a good financial position where they can actually um, defend their market position. Now, that might mean lower earnings, but um, I think they'll be able to defend uh, traffic and listings. See, what I don't understand is the thing about Camplify is, is and Airbnb and, and REA is that you have a two-sided market. And that's quite hard to shift because you have to bring the users over and you have to bring over the suppliers. Yeah, and that's why these companies have failed. Presumably, they're not stupid. No, they're what not. is it? What, what is it that's convinced them that they think they can win this? Success in the US. Um, so they've really? they've done this in the US. So yeah, right. Uh, sorry, on the market have about thirteen thousand agents, uh, and right move have about nineteen thousand agents, which is practically the entire market. So they're buying yeah. the agent yeah. side. Yeah. Um, yeah. And trying to use marketing dollars to win over the other side, the buyers, okay, the okay. eyeballs, um, okay. and, okay. and they have done this with large investments in the United States. So they think they can now move into another country and do it. I'm not as convinced. There are some unique characteristics. Just coming back to REA stock, I'm obsessed about really. <laughs> There's some unique characteristics about the Australian market. I think that that prevents something similar happening here. One is that the seller. Um, pays for the advertising on REA and domain. So the more properties you introduce, the more cost you incur as a seller, the less likely you are to actually pay for a competitor. Um, and uh, the the costs are high. I think uh, sort of years ago, seven years ago, we're talking about when I sold um, my property, I think we paid about three, four grand for each, uh, for a listing on REA and domain. And remember mm. at the time, the agent said, oh, you should pay for... Um, the local paper, the local courier as well. And so I checked out how much that was. It was $6,000 for a little ad in the uh, in the yeah. physical local courier. Yeah. And I just laughed out. I remember yeah, laughing just, in his face. Yeah. You're just <laughs> advertising their, their business for them. Yeah, exactly, yeah. exactly. And it just also, it, so that's one thing. Um, um, that, that also, by the way, highlights just how, I uh, shout out to any real estate agents listening, but um, I just think that's the most useless job in, in the country. You basically list, <laughs> list on um, the, I knew the he's seller. How to, how to win friends and influence. <laughs> well, think about this, right? The seller the seller um, pays thousands of dollars to list a property on the portal that gets people to come and see your house. The real yeah. estate agent opens the door and then takes 2% of the fee. Um, you know, there's a reason why it takes a weekend to become a real estate agent. Um, but, but, the, but, but we'll leave that at that. Um, the other thing that entrenches the, the local too is just the tie-ins with media property as well. So um, Domain is tied in with, with Nine and, and Fairfax and, um, and REA is tied in with, with News Corp. And that seemed, that integration, I think I've underestimated the strength of that in the past, mm. um, but it, it does seem to provide benefits. And uh, another player coming here um, just doesn't, doesn't, doesn't have those linkages, those, those, um, those advantages. And, and likewise, overseas properties don't benefit from those linkages either. So you may breach an overseas portal, um, but you might not breach the local one. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, no, I agree. Does anyone own REA that they can boast like, about how well they've done? Because I certainly don't. <laughs> I don't think we don't own in the funds. <laughs> it's just it's just it's stock that everyone acknowledges is, is maybe the best business in Australia. And I, I find it amazing that, that none of the analysts own it. And we haven't owned in the funds, and it's just um... it's just hard for us to buy a business that always looks so expensive. I think that's yep. one of the mistakes yeah. that we've made. Yeah, you know, yep. over the years we we haven't been prepared to pay up for quality to the extent that we should. And and REA was a great business right from the very start, um, uh, very early on in our history, and we we missed it. I think we missed it. Yep. No, no, you're right. I think um, I think what people always underestimate is just. Even though REA and Domain or REM also have been entrenched for well over a decade or even longer, just how much the market um, you know, grows and then the, the percentage they can take within that. No one thought you know, 15 years ago that you're going to be paying a couple of thousand dollars to REA for a property ad and they're only going to be still taking, I think. Well, well Gorad definitely 10%. didn't. He doesn't even <laughs> think he should now. 
<laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, I think at the the end, there's just so much growth ahead. Because if you look at the transaction um, of property, like it's a massive transaction. And the fee mm -hmm. you pay for the most value in selling that transaction, um, you actually pay the most fee to the agent, whereas the most value is created by the portal. And um, I think that mix between what you pay and what you get is going to change. It has been changing over time. Like the REA's take of, of the, prop, of the uh, transaction value has been rising. But mm -hmm. it's still way below what the agent takes, um, and I think that switch is just going to continue. So it's baked in growth for for years and years and years. There's so much pricing power in, on that REA platform. Um, they've only really scratched the surface. I want to say it's about ten to fifteen percent, uh, and right move is about six percent. The actual take rate of all the um, transaction fees uh, when you sell a property. So yeah, you're right. There's still so much there to go. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I just remember the bill I paid my agent who opened the door and yep. the bill I paid for the portal, which sold the property, it was multiples. I mean, 10 yeah. times. It was an order of magnitude yeah. of difference. Um, yeah. And I just can't imagine that that will persist um, over time. And I, in the, I, I have heard REA management, they don't say this anymore because they, a lot of their customers are, are actually real estate agents, but I have heard them say that... Um, uh, that they, it's a, it's a, it's an open strategy for them to actually take more of that transaction value um, at the expense of agents. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I think so every it's... July first they increase the price. Yeah. Every year, like clockwork. I think this year it was like thirteen percent. Other yeah. years it's eight to ten percent. Yeah. Um, and for everyone, all those real estate agents listening, you can send your complaints to um, intelligentinvestor.com. dot Gents, to wrap up, I thought I would finish with a, a warning sign. Um, I keep seeing a lot of buy recommendations on TPG. I think they still call it TPG Telecom, right? Yeah, on TPG. And uh, I, it, it's a business we recently ceased coverage on. I was scathing of announced plans to sell fiber assets from that company. But when I took a closer look, uh, I can see what's, what's happening here. TPG is failing. And, and I think there's a chance that this company um, disappears or stops providing service to everyone because I, 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 this thing is not working. It is badly run. It is poorly capitalized. And it is, um, in terms of operating success, well, it, it doesn't have very much. And um, that's a lot of that is hidden um, because the numbers are still looking reasonably good. But let's run through... Quickly, um, what's happening here? So TPG is roughly what a six billion dollar market cap. These guys have more than three billion, so three and a half, maybe even four billion dollars of of net debt. And that's an entire, entirely too much debt for a business like this. They're still paying out dividends when they probably shouldn't be, um, and the the PEs and the numbers all look pretty good because they're paying no tax because they have got um, a big load of losses from Vodafone that they're. Um, crunching through. So the margins, the net margins are elevated. The debt is too high. Um, they have a huge CapEx expense. Um, and it looks to me they're not really spending as much on CapEx as Telstra is. Um, so competitively disadvantaged that way. They're sitting on a big load of fiber, which is actually the best part of TPG is the the, the internal fiber business. You know, 65% margins, um, locked in revenue, um, incredibly scalable, might even get to 70 or 80% margin at full scale, but they want to sell all that fiber to repair the balance sheet because that that is just crippling the business. And then you turn to the operations, losing market share on every metric. Um, the Vodafone network is just uneconomic. It is, they're just not making money on the Vodafone network because not enough people use it. This is a big expensive fixed cost. The only way to make money is to get lots and lots of users on, and they're just not getting the users. And And I don't think the Vodafone network is viable. Um, I think we it, it might make sense to close that entire network down or to sell it, um, and it uh, doesn't look like it's ever going to make money to me. I, I think this is a this is a failed business. I I, I think it might even be like technically done. I, I, I'm so negative on TPG. If you own this thing, I would be – this is a hard sell for me. I'd be getting out as fast as I could. All right, hot take, guys. What do you reckon? Um, Nick, you going to sell your stock? <laughs> I don't know, <laughs> thankfully. Um, 
I guess I, I guess it sort of maybe the writing was on the wall two years ago when the founder David Teo just stepped away from the business altogether to go and yeah. pursue our, yep. other uh, ventures, and I think he put a sell recommendation on it at the time, and and looking back on, I know this is with hindsight, but when a founder owner steps away from the business, I think it is better to just you step away as bail. well to sell your stock. Yeah, yeah, just ba- bail with them and. It's it's hard to do because usually the stock's off, you know, twenty percent or so. Yeah. Uh, but I think it's the 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 best choice. Um, and this is just an, another lesson. Um, uh, again, and for me, the other thing it reminds me a little bit of Star to a degree, where you've got this actually really good asset in this case, the fiber asset, but a bad balance sheet. Mm-hmm. Um, and now they now they're getting rid of that great asset um, yep. and star star had this great asset and still does but has you know diluted it away because it's had to use capital raisings rather than an asset sale um to repair it and even really good businesses um when they have bad balance sheets can become quite poor ones pretty quickly balance sheets i, th- I mean we all know this we all know the importance of balance sheet, balance sheets but it's really hit home for me watching the casinos um in particular just how important it is to just not get involved um, with um, debt impaired businesses. Just companies are carrying too much debt. It's so much risk. You only need a small number of things to go wrong, and the whole thing doesn't just go bad. It implodes. I mean, Star is a great lesson, really, and it's one unfortunately we we learned the hard way. Um, I think just like, a... sorry, go on, Nick. Yeah, I think this with a balance sheet risk, I think everyone knows the risks there, but I think yep. they have been forgotten because we've had interest rates at zero yeah, for good point. over a decade. And now mm. that's changing. And these things, you know, uh, companies with debt um, are starting to, um, you know, blow up, I guess. Yep. Gaurav, what's your view on the ACCC? Because they blocked that that um, agreement between Telstra and TPG to get rural access, didn't they? Do you think the A Triple C, if this does fail, are the A Triple C going to have a hand in its failure or not? Yeah, I do not understand that decision. I really don't. Um, you know, the, um, I've done some work with the A Triple C in the in the previous life, and I, I found it to be an incredibly intelligent, thoughtful organisation. This was sort of going about twenty years, but I am um, I just don't understand these recent rulings. Um, there. We can line them up one after the other. Um, you know, I don't understand it, and and this is this is a prime example. I I, I don't get um, the objection. All they were trying to do was to create a legitimate competitor, Telstra, which is the monopoly. And in yeah. doing that, they've sort of named TPG anti-competitive, which just it's it's almost uh, humorous, you know, um, how ridiculous yeah. that is. But but this is what happens when you have a checklist and all you're doing is ticking off a bunch of um, rules unthinkingly, um, mm. you end up being counterproductive and, and doing the opposite of what you're trying to to achieve. I think you can see that in the US as well with Lena Khan, um, where the the Department of Justice there are clearly going after big tech, but they're just going about it in a way that really doesn't make a lot of logical sense and are going to undermine the case for antitrust measures in presenting cases and going before courts and arguing for stuff that really, from a user perspective, doesn't make a lot of sense. Yeah, I think yeah. they're going to lose a lot of political legitimacy in the way they're going about it and the and the companies and the cases they're choosing to prosecute. This seems like a likely example of that. It just doesn't make a lot of sense. I just want to cycle back on one thing that Nick said. Nick, you mentioned about the um, what to do when the founder leaves. I was just thinking, as you said it, that um, LaVisa is actually that's my biggest holding at the moment. Um, when the founder of LaVisa, LaVisa left that business, um, the stock price fell a little bit, but I wasn't at all, it never even crossed my mind to sell stock or to exit the stock because the relationship of the founder to that business was secondary when compared to the relationship between Brett Blundy and that business. Mm. Blundy, yeah. tomorrow, out yeah. of the blue, sold his stock and resigned from the board. I would sell my stock very, very quickly. Yeah. And so it's you, there is some nuance in these decisions, and um, Tio not only was he the founder of TPG, he was the industry doyen. He was the mastermind behind this whole thing, and the the departure came with no warning. It was sudden and it was absolutely complete. He had sold out his stock very soon afterwards, and 
Um, his son um, left as well, and I think it's, um, it's it's a very different scenario. Yeah, absolutely. It's the same with um, you know, Jeff Bezos stepping away a little bit at Amazon. Yeah. You know, but you know, you're not worried. He's still got his stake there. I think he's still the executive chairman, and yeah. it was um, you know sort of uh, something you could sort of foresee happening. Bill Gates at Microsoft, for example, is another one. Um, but yeah, this case was was very different. Mm. All right, um, let's wrap it up there, guys. Uh, great conversation. John, um, thanks so much for, for taking one for the team, going to the conference and, and taking notes on... Taking maybe... one for the team. It wasn't that hard. <laughs> I think sitting through a bunch of crappy microcaps. Yeah, no, you that, took one for true. the team. Yeah. Well, Nathan's doing that today, so it'll probably right. need to be to be picked up tomorrow. There's a reason why Nathan owns yeah. the big bucks, you know, for stuff like this, stuff like this. <laughs> uh, thanks for your time, John. Um, Thank you. Nick, um, maybe you know, maybe it's my turn to have a, a, a weird piece of undergarments um, in my background next time. <laughs> John yeah. did it. You, you've you've done the the. That's right. Your, your bit. I need to do something I, as I'll well. I set a trend here. Yeah, <laughs> just a, just a, maybe I'll just an odd <laughs> a joke on the raw whiteboard. That'd be great. I was thinking about that. We should start writing something on that whiteboard. That whiteboard is is used um, in. In my day to day life, that that thing is used a lot, but I can always, yeah, I think it's a good idea. It'll come out backwards when if I write something, I have to write it yeah, in reverse, do I? I don't even know how that works. We'll no, try it out. I don't think so. No, I don't think so. Yep, but now I know nothing about recording after all these years. <laughs> <laughs> it's not a mirror. It's not a mirror. There you go. <laughs> all right, this is the perfect time to sign off. Thanks very much for joining me, okay. gents, and um, for everyone else, thank you for listening.